So game theory is fun because it sounds fun. You're doing this theory of games. Um, when I took my first economics class ever, um, it was my first year of my MPA program in 2010. Um, and when I saw that there was a section called game theory on the syllabus, I got really excited because I had no clue what that meant. And I figured it was like, here's some strategies to help you win at Dominoes and Monopoly and Settlers of Catan and these other games. And um, maybe it's about like different strategies for interacting with people. And that would be fun. Um, and then I started reading the textbook and it was like not that at all and terrifying. Um, so it has nothing to do with like games. Um, what it has to do with instead is um, how people interact with each other and kind of giving a mathy way of, of thinking about, um, a systematic mathy way of thinking about how people interact with each other. Um, in the very first session, we talked about this principle here, like what is economics? It's how people interact with each other in providing for their livelihoods. And the thing we care about here is this idea of interacting with each other. Um, that's something we care a lot, care a lot about in economics care about a lot in economics. Um, we want to measure how people interact with each other and see how they, they change their behavior in, the, in their interactions, which means we need, we need some sort of formal language for measuring how people um, do interact with each other. Um, and so that is what game theory is. It's a, it's a framework for thinking about how two people interact with each other or multiple people interact with each other. That's all we're trying to measure here. Um, it's just, and that's called a game um, for whatever reason. So some key vocabulary terms that we need to remember as we talk about these different game theory aspects here. When we talk about a game, again, it's not like a board game or chess or anything like that. It's a model of strategic interaction. This just means if you have two people that interact with each other, it's how they actually end up interacting with each other and kind of what the payoffs are and what the strategies are um, in what they actually do. So that is one thing we care about, this idea of a game. Um, another key vocabulary term that we'll talk about when we talk about these games is you can have a zero-sum game, which means there's only one winner in the interaction. Only one person will walk away with kind of the most points, um, and the other person will be a loser. So that's the zero-sum idea. A non-zero-sum game is the opposite of that. Anybody can win. Um, if people can cooperate, then both players will come off um, better. They'll end up better because of their cooperation. And so that's, that's this, this difference here. Zero sum means only one winner. Non-zero sum means everybody can win. Um, and then we have this idea called Pareto efficiency. And we'll talk about this um, in the next session especially. Um, it has a very specific meaning in economics and in setting policy. Um, the idea behind Pareto efficiency is that an outcome, whatever the two players decide to do, it cannot be changed or improved without hurting somebody else. And we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll see some better examples of this. Um, so what that means is if one person gets like a $5 reward for choosing an option, um, they can't choose any other strategy that will move them down from $5. If, if, they, if there was an alternative that would bring them down to like $4, that's not Pareto efficient, that would hurt them. And so $5 is kind of their most Pareto efficient outcome there. And we'll see examples of that. So pay attention to that um, in this session and in the next section, next session. It'll make a lot more sense. Um, but this is just kind of a list of vocabulary terms that we should care about. When two people interact with each other, there are specific strategies and language about the strategies with what they're supposed to choose. Um, the main thing we care about is this idea of Nash equilibrium. Um, which means um, it's a choice where no player has an incentive to change. Um, and so if one person decides to, to choose option A, um, it's because that is their best option. Like option B is not good. Option A is the best regardless of what the other person is going to do. And so that is kind of where people settle um, in their choices is where you, wherever you have a Nash equilibrium. This is named after a guy named John Nash who was um, a mathematician. There's a famous Oscar-winning movie about him called A Beautiful Mind. Um, you may have seen memes of it with like him drawing on, on windows with whiteboard markers. That's the Beautiful Mind guy. He's the guy who helped kind of invent this whole field of uh, game theory. So it's this Nash equilibrium idea is kind of named after him. Um, some other key vocabulary terms, and we'll see examples of this, so don't worry if it doesn't quite make sense yet. 
Um, a dominant strategy is a choice where you win or you get positive um, benefit no matter what the other person does. And so if, if the other person has to choose between option A and option B, regardless of what they choose, you're going to win. Um, and so that's a dominant strategy, which means you're going to do it pretty much every time because you're going to win regardless. A pure strategy is a choice that you make every single time, even if it's not always the best payoff. And this is where we, we start talking about this prisoner's dilemma idea, where the pure strategy is actually to defect um, and to rat out your, your co-conspirator, um, which is a worse outcome for society, but it's kind of what you're supposed to do because of the structure of the incentives. Um, a mixed strategy, on the other hand, is something that's a little bit more complicated. You have to make your choice of what you want to do depending on what you think the other person is going to do. You essentially have to read their mind and kind of guess what they're going to do and then make your choice based on that. And that's where most game theory lives, is in this, this world of mixed strategies. Um, game theory was extremely popular back during the Cold War. Um, the military today still uses game theorists to help decide military strategy and diplomatic strategy. Um, and the reason we have um, extensive spy networks, we had expensive spy networks throughout the Soviet Union, was in part to inform um, the mixed strategies of the game theorists, where they wanted to see what the Soviet Union was going to choose in specific situations, trying to read their mind and guess the probability that they would make one specific choice, because then that would influence what we would do on our end. Um, and so this is a, a very common thing. Um, we're not going to go into all of the math with mixed strategies. There's an extra credit question in the problem set where you can calculate some mixed strategies. Um, and there is a page on the resources section of the course website that it walks through all of the math of how you do a mix or how you solve a mixed strategy game. Um, if you're interested, go ahead and check that out. You don't need to be able to do that for the exam. You don't need to know that at all. Just know that it exists. Um, if you're interested, do it. That would be neat. Okay, so the way this stuff works is in any strategic interaction, if you have two players, two people um, that are meeting each other and they have to decide what is best for them depending on what the other person is doing, um, every option they have has what is called a payoff. And you'll see it often in a grid like this, this two by two matrix here. Um, and a payoff, if you look at these numbers here, this one, three, four, four, two, two, three, one, um, these numbers can be dollar amounts um, but typically they're just like utility points or happiness points or what economists call utils, U-T-I-L-S, which is a unit of utility that's just kind of a made up thing. Um, but it still represents something. So the reason this matters, um, and well, the way you read these tables here is typically you'll see two numbers here. The first number corresponds to the player or the actor that's on the rows here. So Anil here, if he plants rice, he'll get one util of benefit, one happiness point if he plants rice. And that's because if you remember from the readings here, Anil is really good at growing cassava. That's kind of his specialty. Um, so if he had to grow rice, he could do that, but he's not gonna be super happy about it. And so that's why we have this one point here. He's good at rice, he's kind of okay at rice. He'll get one point of happiness. You could also say $100 of profit if he sells rice some unit again the units don't actually matter this is just saying like one unit of happiness versus four units of happiness if he could grow cassava okay so that's what that first number means the second number in each of the cells represents the payoff for the column person so bala here if bala can grow rice then he'll get three happiness points um which is good he's good at growing rice and so he wants to be able to grow the rice here um and so that's what we care about so that, that's how you read these things. So in each of these cells, what this means is if Anil grows cassava and Bala grows cassava, this is how many happiness points each of the players get, three and one. If Anil grows rice and Bala grows cassava, they'll each get two happiness points. If Anil grows cassava and Bala grows rice, then they each get four happiness points. So looking at this table here, what you generally want to do is see what is kind of the most socially optimal outcome. What is the best square for everybody in this situation? And the square where both players get the most points is kind of the best place you want to end up, which in this case, we want to make it so that Anil grows cassava and Bala grows rice, because then they each get four happiness points. 
um, because that's what they're best at and they can trade and everybody's happy because of that. So the way you solve these things, this is the math part, which again involves no actual equations. It all just involves covering up a column and then looking at numbers. And there's, there's a specific strategy for doing this, and this is um, from the core textbook, but we'll walk through a bunch of examples of how to do this. So what we do is you go through a, a four-step process here. We first cover up this column here. We ignore that. If we were in person, I would put my arm up on the board, just covering up this thing. We're not even thinking about cassava. What we're saying is if you are Anil and you know that Bala is growing rice, that's the choice that Bala has made. You know that that's going to happen. What is your best choice? Should you grow rice or should you grow cassava? And you know that Bala is growing rice. So you look at whatever number is the highest. And so here you get one util or one happiness point. Here you get four. So your best choice if Bala grows rice is cassava because that gets you four points. So you draw a circle in that square um, or in that, that rectangle here. So if Bala chooses rice, Anil's best choice is to grow cassava. Okay. The next thing we want to do is consider the other choice. So if we know that Bala is going to grow cassava, so let's ignore rice for now. So again, you're thinking about Anil, and you're saying, I know if, if I know that Bala is going to grow cassava, what should I do? So you look at these numbers. You could, grow, you could do two if you grew rice, or you would get three if you grew cassava, which means you should grow cassava. So in this situation, what we end up getting is something called a dominant strategy. Um, regardless of what Bala chooses to grow, if Bala does rice or Bala does cassava, for Anil, the very best thing for him to do is to grow rice or to grow cassava, regardless of what Bala chooses. Because that circle means if Bala chooses rice, do cassava. If Bala chooses cassava, chooses cassava, also do cassava. So that's Anil's best choice there is to always grow cassava. So we figured out what Anil should do. Now we need to look at what Bala should do. And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to cover up a row and we're going to say, assume that Anil is growing rice. And so we can kind of cover up this cassava column or cassava row. We're going to ignore that. We're only going to look at what happens, what Bala should do if um, he knows that Anil is going to grow rice. And so you compare the numbers. We're looking at the second numbers this time because those correspond to Bala here. So if he knows that Anil is going to grow rice, he could either choose rice, which would give him three points, or he could choose cassava, which would give him two points. So the best choice for Bala here, assuming Anil does rice, is, or yeah, assuming Anil does rice, is also rice. So for that player, we put a dot. Um, it doesn't matter what symbol you use. You could do a square and a rectangle. You could do a star and a, a circle, whatever you want. It's just some sort of symbol that says this is the best choice for player two or for Bala here. Assuming that Anil grows rice. So let's erase some of these because we know that that is the best option. So let's ignore that. So now what we want to do is we say, let's now assume that Anil is growing cassava. So ignore this row. Cover up that row. Don't even look at it. Instead, if Bala says, um, Anil is going to grow cassava, what should I do? Then Bala should look at the payoffs here. He could get four utils if he grows rice, or he could get one util if he grows cassava. Highest payoff is rice. And so we put a dot right there because he's going to grow rice. Okay, so let's erase those here. So what we end up with here is um, Bala, regardless of what Anil chooses, will always grow rice. And Anil, regardless of what um, Bala decides to do, will always grow cassava, um, which is why this is called the invisible hand game. They will just naturally choose the thing that they're best at because of the structure of the payoffs. Um, Anil will always choose cassava because he's the best at it. Bala will always choose rice because that's what he's best at. And then they'll settle on this outcome here, which is the socially optimal outcome. That's the one we care about. And they made it. 
without even having to coordinate with each other. This was just them sitting in opposite ends of a village deciding how many how many happiness points, how much money could I make if I do this and the other person does this, or if I do this and the other person does option B. And then they end up deciding their best options and it results in kind of the best social outcome. Um, so that is an example of how this game works where you have a non-zero sum game. There's no winner and loser. Um, they both end up with four happiness points and there's one dominant equilibrium where they will always choose those options. This right here where they both line up where you have a circle and a dot, that is what is called a Nash equilibrium. That is kind of where they will settle regardless of, of the other person's choices. And so this game has one Nash equilibrium. Okay, so that is just one type of game, this invisible hand game. Not all of them look like this. Um, there are often situations where um, you can have multiple equilibrium. So a famous example, um, kind of a, a canonical type of game here, is this idea of the Bach or Stravinsky game. And the idea behind this is um, if you have two friends um, that want to go to either a Bach concert or a Stravinsky concert, um, they have to choose which one they want. That's where the name comes from. Um, but in this situation, we won't talk about Bach and Stravinsky. We'll talk about restaurants. Um, so if you have two friends and they both have preferences for food, one likes Chinese food a lot and one likes Italian food a lot, um, and they can't coordinate with each other. They don't know their cell phones or both their cell phones have died or something. They can't coordinate with each other. They have to figure out where they're going to meet their friend for lunch. Okay, so if we look at friend one here and we look at their payoffs, um, if they eat Chinese food, they get two happiness points. That's their favorite food. They like that food. If they eat Italian food by themselves because the other person doesn't show up, they show up at the Italian restaurant and the other person goes to the Chinese restaurant, then they get zero happiness points because they don't like Italian food a lot and they're not with their friend. And so that's a sad outcome there. Um, if they both end up at the same place, friend one will get one happiness point um, because they're with their friend, but it's not as good as Chinese food. They like the Chinese food better. And so they prefer this outcome. They're okay with this. This is bad for friend one. The same, situa same situation happens with friend two. They like Italian food the most. They get two happiness points for doing that. They're okay with Chinese food, um, but if they end up at the Italian restaurant or at yeah, if they end up at the Italian restaurant and their friend isn't there, then that's super sad. Um, and so everybody's worse off in those situations. Okay, so let's go through the same thing that we did with Neil and Bala here. Um, there we go. Let's erase it. So we're going to cover up. We're going to go with friend one first. So we're going to cover up this whole column. We're going to ignore that. And what we're going to say is if you're friend one, you have to say, Assume friend two is going to the Chinese restaurant. Where should I go? And so you look at your payoffs. You could either get two utils or zero utils. You want two. So that is your choice if you think friend two is going to get Chinese food. Okay. But now we need to cover up the other column. So let's erase that. So now you can say, ignore this Chinese column. Friend two assume they go and get Italian food, where should I go? You could either get zero points if you go uh, to get Italian food, or you could get, or if, if you go to Chinese food here, or if you go to the Italian restaurant, then you get one point. And so that's your best option there, okay? You shouldn't, so if you assume that they're gonna go to the Italian restaurant, you should not choose Chinese. If you assume they're going to go to the Chinese restaurant, you should not go to Italian because you're gonna end up at the wrong place. So that, that's what's that, what that's showing here. So let's erase those. So that's player one. Eraser. Okay, so if you're player two, now we do the same thing, but row-wise. We cover up one of the rows at the bottom here. And you say, if you're friend two, and you're assuming friend one is going to go to the Chinese restaurant, where should you go? So you look at your payoffs. You could get one util if you go to Chinese. You could get zero utils if you go to Italian. So you should go to... Chinese. We have a Nash equilibrium there. Hooray. Because you're both going to end up at Chinese there. Um, but let's look at the other row here. So let's erase here and there and there. Okay, so if we cover up this first row and you're friend two and you say, let's assume that friend one is definitely going to an Italian restaurant. Where should I go? 
Um, you could either get zero utils by going to the Chinese restaurant, or you could get two utils by going to the Italian restaurant. So you should go to the Italian restaurant. Okay, so what you end up with is two Nash equilibria. You have both friends going to a Chinese restaurant and both friends going to an Italian restaurant. What's really interesting about this, though, is if they can't coordinate, um, they're just going to have to guess and, and gamble. And it is entirely possible that they're going to guess wrong. Friend one can say, I think that friend two is going to choose Chinese today. And so they'll show up at the Chinese restaurant, but friend two actually went to the Italian restaurant and oh no. It's a coordination issue. It's a collective action problem. You can't get everybody on board without some way to, to get people to communicate there. Um, and so even though this is the Nash equilibrium, or you have two different ones, they have to choose and they have to gamble and guess at, at what the other person's going to do and hope that it ends up right. Um, and this is, again, why we have spies in the Cold War feeding information into the game theorists um, because they want to be able to read their friend or read the other person's mind. If friend one knows that friend two just barely went to a Chinese restaurant yesterday and probably doesn't want Chinese, then they're going to say they're probably going to go to an Italian restaurant. And so I should also go to the Italian restaurant because I'm guessing that's what's going to happen. Um, so that is um, what happens in this type of situation in this Bakker Stravinsky game. Um, there are other situations here. This is a game called Chicken, where the Nash Equilibrium, there are actually multiple of them, just like um, the other, just like this bakker Stravinsky thing. Um, let's go through the same situation here. So this, the, the situation here is if you have two cars racing at each other he at full speed, heads on, um, the payoffs here are structured in a way that if they both keep going and they crash into each other, you get negative 100 utils or negative a million utils, like they both die and that's bad. You don't want to have them both keep going and, and hit each other. But you get benefit if one of you swerves and gives up and the other one doesn't. And so that's where these payoffs come from. If racer one um, decides to keep going, um, so yeah, racer one decides to keep going. They get five benef five points of happiness because racer two kind of has to lose and move out, move off to the side. They blinked first, and so they get negative points there. Same thing here. If racer two keeps going, um, but then um, racer one swerves, racer one will get negative five points, but racer two will get the benefit of keeping going, and they didn't blink. If they both swerve at the same time and they both blink, then they end up with no points and they just kind of skulk away and don't talk about what they failed to do. So that, that's the situation here. And again, this is kind of a, a contrived situation, um, but it does reveal, it, it, it is reflected in real life. If you have a situation like a government shutdown um, where two parties are threatening to shut down the government, it's essentially a game of chicken where they don't want to be the party that concedes to the other one, but they also don't want to actually shut down the government. And so they're waiting until the very last minute until one of them blinks and decides to give up. Um, and occasionally we get the government shut down because they end up in the keep going, keep going square here. Um, so this, this does happen in real life here. So to figure out the strategies here, we do the same column and row covering up thing that we've been doing. So if you're racer one, we ignore the swerve column and we say, racer two, they're going to definitely keep going. What should I do? So you look at your payoffs. So if you know that racer two is going to keep going, if you keep going, you're going to get negative 100. You don't want that. If you swerve, you're going to get negative five. So that's what you're going to end up doing if you know that racer two is going to keep going. So then let's cover up the keep going column here and only look at swerve. So you know that racer two is definitely going to swerve. So if you're racer one, you should either keep, if you keep going, you get five points of benefit. If you swerve, you get zero points of benefit. So you should keep going. That's the best option for you if you know that they're going to swerve. Okay, so now if we do it row wise, let's cover up that row here. If you're racer two and you know racer one is going to keep going, you can either get negative 100 or negative five. So you want that negative five. You're going to swerve because you know they're going to keep going. And then same thing with the other row here. If you're racer two and you know that racer one is going to swerve, you can either get five points or zero points. So you want to go for the five because that's going to be your best option. So what we end up with is 
to Nash equilibria, just like we had before. Um, but there's no guarantee that you're going to land on one of those. It's really just an instance of the racers trying to read each other's minds and, and knowing, like, are they really going to choose to keep going or are they going to swerve or what's going to happen? Um, and then they have to calculate the probabilities in their head and say, maybe I will swerve because I don't want to get hurt today or I think they're actually going to swerve, so I will keep going. Um, and so that's the risk you run. You essentially have to gamble and hope that you choose the right one here. And so that's, that's what this game of chicken looks like here. Um, one of the most famous game theory games um, that you'll come across in lots of your classes in this program, um, because for whatever reason people are obsessed with this prisoner's dilemma idea, is where you have a situation where the socially optimal outcome is not actually attainable because the incentives are lined up that makes it so nobody will achieve it. Um, so the example from the reading that you had was you had Anil and Bala are both farmers and they need to take care of the insects in their farms. They can either use this, this special bug situation, that, like these special bugs that eat the, the bad pests, so it's like this natural pesticide, or they can use poison, which is really effective at killing the bugs, but it also uh, washes downstream and hurts the, the crops of the other person. So those, those are the choices they have. They can either use these, these special bugs or they can use poison to get rid of the, um, the bad insects. So let's go through the same column and row uh, process that we've been doing before. So we're going to cover up this poison column and ignore it. And so if you're a Neil and you say, I know Bala is going to use the magic bugs, what should I do? So you could either get three utils if you use magic bugs, or you could get four utils if you use poison. Um, so if you know that Bala is going to do magic bugs, you should poison because that's what the payoffs are because uh, this is more effective for you. Okay, then we can cover up the magic bugs column. So ignore this here. And you say, if you're a Neil and you know that Bala is going to poison, use the poison insecticide, what should you do? Um, you could either get one util if you use your magic bugs or you could get two utils if you use the poison. And so you end up using the bad insecticide um, because that's best for you. Okay, so that's what we have for Anil. He's either going to poison, or he's always going to poison regardless of what Bala chooses. So he has a dominant strategy. Um, so let's erase this stuff. Eraser. Okay, so those are Bala's cho or Anil's choices regardless of what Bala does. He's always going to poison. So now we'll do the same thing here. We'll ignore the poison row. If you're Bala and you know that Anil is going to use the magic bugs, um, you'll either get three points if you also use the magic bugs, or you'll get four utils if you use the poison. So you're going to poison. Okay. If we ignore this row now and come down to here and say you're Bala and you know that Anil is going to use the poison, what should you do? You can either get one point if you use the magic bugs or two points if you use the poison, which means you will also poison. And so here's our Nash equilibrium. Regardless of what the other person chooses, you're going to end up with, with a worse social situation. Um, look at the payoffs here. They each get two points. So there's four total units of, of benefit to society here because they ended up here. If they could land on this square here, that's six units of benefit to society. The world is better off if they can hit this square here, if they can both use magic bugs. Um, the world will be happier, there will be fewer pesticides in the world, and everybody will grow more, and it'll be happier. But because of the incentives of the structure of the incentives here and how big the points are, um, they're always going to end up in this in this quadrant here, regardless of what the other person chooses, which is suboptimal. And it's socially not optimal. Society is worse off because of that. And so that is why we have this, this idea of a prisoner's dilemma, where people, people are locked into suboptimal choices because of how the incentive structures are, are made. Um, individual choices lead to worse social outcomes. And that is, that is kind of the main reason we care about prisoner's dilemmas in public policy and public administration classes because often lots of social situations are this type of thing where nobody's going to cooperate because nobody wants to cooperate because there's no incentive to cooperate and then society is worse off as a result. 
Um, so that is a quick crash course into game theory. Um, if all you need to remember from this is cover up the, the columns, figure out which number is the highest, cover up the rows, figure out which number is the highest, and see if um, there are any Nash equilibrium. Um, if there is just one, that means that's always going to be the choice. If there's two, that means it's going to be one of those two choices, depending on how people gamble, but you might end up in the off squares as well in worse outcomes. So game theory, that's your super fast crash course.